If you have a Bible, um, maybe on your phone or your laptop or something else, or in paper form, would you turn with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 9? Isaiah chapter 9. If you'd like a Bible, there's some at the back or some on that shelf over there. Little preacher in the making coming up here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah 9. Nevertheless, nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Let's pray as we begin to think about these words a little bit. Thank you, Lord, for your your word. Thank you for the written word that points us to you, Jesus, the living word. Lord, would you open our eyes this morning to see you, our ears to hear you, our hearts and minds to respond to you, and Lord, our hands to do your will. We pray in your name. Amen. I mean, well, I don't really like rituals too much. Um, it's a bit tough in a profession such as mine, uh, where rituals are, are everywhere, aren't they? In church, they're all over the place. Uh, but there is one ritual that I perennially enjoy, and that is the lighting of the Advent wreath. I don't, ever since I was a kid, I don't know what it is, I've always just been drawn to the Advent wreath. I don't know whether it's because I was included as a child in that particular ritual in a very hands-on way, but every year, I, it's like the perfect start for me for the season of Advent. Uh, Advent candles mean various different things and depending on which wing of the church you are up or down the candle, it will, it will mean different things. But this year we are using it in this church uh, week by week to help us think about uh, the good news of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. And this week we'll be thinking about hope. Uh, next week we'll be thinking about justice. The week after that, peace. The week after that, joy. And then, of course, we will be uh, into Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. The good news of Jesus Christ, it is good news. I believe it from the bottom of my heart that Jesus is good news. And uh, as already been alluded to uh, today, in this room, I'm sure that there will be a mixture of feelings uh, towards Christmas. Some of us will be really enjoying uh, the build-up, the anticipation, the waiting, and we're going to really enjoy Christmas for lots and lots of different reasons. Uh, but for, other of, for others of us, uh, it, it can be a painful time. It, it can be hard. Some of us won't look forward to it. Some of us will already have our tree up. Anyone got their tree up? I've seen some, there's one, there's two, I see three. I've seen lots of photos of trees up this weekend. Uh, yesterday I was at two Christmas fairs, a preschool Christmas fair and a school, infant school uh, Christmas fair and um, 
It was all right. <laughs> and my one, my one take home, actually, uh, from them was, we teach kids to gamble at a very young age. I bought, uh, a, I bought three tickets for a pound to win a bottle. Uh, the, the number had to end in a five. I didn't get one. You know what I did? I went back again. Didn't win. You know what I did? I went back again. I still didn't win a bottle. Three quid, nine tickets, no bottle. Gutted. Raffles, Tom Bowler. You see where I'm going? This is... No wonder people get hooked in gambling habits. Teach them at school. Anyway, that's like not part of the... Talk. Just We're going to edit that out later. <laughs> uh, for some, the idea of spending hours, days with friends uh, and family, even living in our, in our homes, is just a source of absolute joy. There's nothing that we enjoy more than coming down and sharing breakfast with our uh, mother-in-law in our pyjamas, whatever it, it might be. For others, of, and it's heavenly, for, for others of us, that's like the worst feeling in the world. In fact, spending more than an hour with a whole bunch of other people is very difficult for some of us. And we need to recognize that with one another, that there'll be a range of feelings towards these rituals that we put into, uh, into Christmas. But whether you're looking forward to, to Christmas or not, I think and I believe that the season that we're in now, these uh, 24 more precious days, 23 if it's up to the last Sunday in Advent, it's a very precious gift to us. Uh, it's a very deep spiritual time for us that if we allow God's spirit to move amongst us and move within, it within us, um, I think that we will get closer uh, to the truth of who God is revealed in Jesus Christ, his son. And we will be filled with excitement and, and, and his anticipation for his return again. Uh, Advent is a very precious time and I'd love us to uh, use the gift really well over the next few weeks. Our passage today from Isaiah chapter 9, you might have heard that one or two or three or however many years you've been in the church before. Every Christmas time we read this passage from Isaiah 9 and it's amazing, isn't it? It's such a beautiful passage. It speaks uh, of a people living, a Jewish People living in Jerusalem, in Israel. Uh, and they were, at the time, very oppressed, very suppressed, and very depressed. Gloomy stuff. Uh, politically, their country was in crisis. Know what I'm saying? Politically, their country was in crisis. It rings some bells for me. Philosophically, its country was in crisis. Spiritually, its country was in crisis. Fear was crippling the community living in Jerusalem. There were conspiracy stories going around. There was like just bad news, scaremongering, just floating all over the place. One commentator I read this week uh, said this, that Jerusalem was a pot boiling, ready to boil over. Just, just tense. You can just... Feel it in the atmosphere. Something is about to erupt. Anyone that's seen any news over the last few days might feel like we're boiling away a little bit at the moment as a country. We need to pray about our country right now. Whilst without question the people living in Jerusalem were very proud of their Jewish identity, racially, their Jewish identity, they have moved away uh, from, their, from their religious Jewish identity. In terms of their heritage, they were Jew through and through. But, but spiritually, religiously, they were moving away. You could say that they were kind of in this phase of post-Jewishness. Uh, some people say of our country in the West that we're in a, Christ, a post-Christian uh, state, a, 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 a secularist state, i.e. we have a, a Christian heritage uh, which informs a lot of who we are now and the rules and the laws that, uh, and the schooling and the NHS, the healthcare. It informs all that, but we, we've kind of removed the God bit, the Christ bit. Someone once said that if you remove, if, uh, uh, 
Christianity without Christ, if you remove Christ from Christianity, all you're left with is Ian. If you remove Christ from Christian, all you're left with is, is, is Ian. I know a few Ians around the place. They're nice blokes, but they ain't going to save the world. They, the people living there, they just moved away from, from the moral codes that kept their society operating in the way that they should. They'd moved away from their acts of worship that kept their eyes fixed on God and having a God perspective. And they were just caught in, in gloom and misery and, and depression. In chapter 8, verse 21 uh, we're told this, distressed and hungry, they will roam through the land. When they are famished, they will become enraged and looking upward will curse their king and their God. They will look towards the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom and they will be thrust into utter darkness. It's the people who were just gripped with the negative gripped by pessimism, just, just gripped with this angry outlook on life. And needless to say that the situation uh, of the atmosphere in Jerusalem was hopeless. What hopelessness is, it's a life without hope. Just given up on hope. But into this hopeless situation, Isaiah has a choice to make. Uh, do I keep on uh, just preaching hellfire and brimstone at them? Do I just keep going and keep going? And if I preach it enough times, loud enough, they're going to get it. Or do I just give up and go home? It's just hopeless. I'm just going to join in with their hopelessness. But he chooses a third option. And that is he decides to focus on the people who are listening. He decides, I've got this word from God and I'm going to preach it to the people who have ears to hear, uh, my disciples. The message that Isaiah had to preach is the most beautiful, amazing, fantastic, uh, good news there is going. In chapter 9, uh, in, in chapter nine we, we hear this, that there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. Remember, we've just been told that they're distressed and hungry, roaming through the land, they're famished, they become enraged, uh, they look towards the earth and see distress and darkness and gloom. But this is the message of chapter 9. There will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. That's great news. Those who have been previously humbled and pushed down and subjected by society will be elevated and raised and honoured there will be a shared sense of dignity. That's good news. Those walking in darkness will see a great light. That's good news. There will be an increase in the levels of people's joy. That is great news. Imagine if we were a joyful little community. All oh, those people in Twitter, they're always joyful, aren't they? Always got a smile on their face. Always joking. Always happy. There's something deep within them where there's just a contentment, a joy in life. God was going to bring salvation. God was going to bring redemption to the people living in Jerusalem. But it wasn't going to be instantaneous. It wasn't going to be immediate. In fact, it would take 700 years for this prophecy to come to fruition, to become true. From the time that Isaiah preached this out loud, it would be 700 years before uh, Christ the Messiah would be, would be born. Uh, we are conditioned in our society to want stuff and want stuff now. Uh, we're conditioned as a society just to, uh, if we need something to make sure we can find a way to get it, in fact, we've just developed systems and technology specifically to, to, to increase our productivity, uh, to speed up uh, life, to help us get what we want quicker than if we didn't have that machine. Uh, we are people generally who can't wait, won't wait. And frankly, we don't need to wait for anything anymore. 
Uh, I don't know if you've heard the uh, acronym F O M O. F O M O, otherwise known as FOMO. If you haven't heard of this, my telling you this and you're remembering this will lift your cool status up about 80%. FOMO stands for fear of missing out. Fear of missing out. And we have a whole generation of kids growing up who are, who are just being conditioned with this thing called FOMO. They're just little kids in schools who are worried about not having the right trainers or not being able to go on the trip or whatever it, whatever it might be. Just, they're just developing a fear at a young age. Fear is, is crippling for us. Interestingly, we're meant to have a righteous fear of God. A righteous fear of God. Uh, we look all over the place for peace. Look all over the place for joy. We look all over the place for love and happiness and, and justice. We want someone to make sure we get what's right. We look everywhere, but often as a society we forget to look in the one place that it's been promised we can get it. And when I say get it, it's an act of grace. Jesus, the Messiah, he's full of peace. He's the Prince of Peace. He's full of joy, full of righteousness and justice and love. He is our true hope. Isaiah 8, 17 uh, speaks of this beautiful intersection between waiting and trusting. It says, I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. I will put my trust in him. Trusting involves waiting. Trusting involves waiting. I.e. believing in results that aren't there yet. Believing in the unseen. Uh, I want now, I think, is probably a failure to trust. I want it now. I'm going to get it now. That's different to just trusting on the promises that it is coming. It will come. It will come in its right time. Uh, when we struggle to trust in the future promises, I think we may have trouble hoping in Christ. But here's the good news, that everything we can find, need, Everything that we could ever want is found in Jesus Christ. Isaiah 8, um, 14, just going backwards again before we get to Isaiah 9. It says this, um, And the Lord Almighty will be a sanctuary for both houses of Israel. He will be a, a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Uh, I, I'm interested by this. The, the idea that God is a rock is all over scripture. But previously I've thought of him as a rock, a strong place and a refuge. In Ephesians it talks about Jesus as the cornerstone. In Matthew 7 Jesus describes those who put their trust in the words that Jesus preaches and, and acts upon them. It's like those who build their house on a strong foundation, a rock. Yet here the rock is the one that causes a stumbling point. Oh, we know, don't we, that for some, the message of Christ is a stumbling point. And for others, it is the very foundation that they need to build their structures of their lives. Anyone who's ever stubbed their toe on a rock will know just how much it hurts. I mean, it really hurts. We split our toes open. There's it's painful. We curse when we hit the rock. We get angry. Anyone who's ever tripped up on a rock will know the bruises that are left afterwards. Let's be people who build our houses on the rock, who ensure that our lives are built on Christ, the cornerstone, and not to be those who trip up uh, on, on him. Jesus here is described as the one who brings peace in the place of anxiety, joy in the place of sorrow. And when we feel judged by the world, 
our passage here says that we have a one who is who's just and, and righteous. One who does not uh, condemn those who, who love him, who are called according to his purposes. Though the world may, may judge us, uh, we can trust that the judge of space and history will act fairly in our defense. Jesus, the Messiah, who, who preached the good news of the kingdom of God. Remember, that was his gospel. His gospel was the good news of the kingdom of God. He not, he not only preached it out loud, but he demonstrated it uh, with his hands. Jesus, this one who humbled himself, who left the glory of heaven, who became a, a baby, God wrapped in human flesh, as one theologian said. He knows our poverty. He knows our weaknesses. For goodness sake, he was born to the poorest of poor people. He was born in a stinky stable, in the poorest of conditions. He lived a pauper's life. He, he, had, to, he had a father who, who worked, manu- it was a manual laborer. And no doubt he followed his father into that. He was not a rich man. I don't know whether Isaiah had that idea when he wrote this. I don't know if, I, if Isaiah thought to himself, he's, he's not going to come as a king or a, or a knight or a or a rich prince dressed in crown, uh, crowns of jewels, here becoming as a baby. I have no idea what Isaiah was thinking when he wrote these words. But he said this. This is what he did see. Verse 6 of chapter 9. A child to us is born. To us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the best therapist there ever is. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Does anyone need peace in this place today? Of the greatness and his, of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with righteousness, justice and righteousness. From that time on, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Don't you love that word zeal? I think we should use the word zeal even more. You know what that means? That means I've set my mind to something and I'm going to make it happen. I've got something in my belly, something in my heart to make sure something happens and I'm jolly well going to make sure that happens. The zeal of the Lord, the fire in his belly was going to accomplish it. What was it that he was going to accomplish? Jesus came to inaugurate, that's a fancy word for begin, for to start the kingdom of God here on earth. You know what he's going to do when he comes again? This is what we're remembering at Advent. He's going to, fancy word, consummate his kingdom. He's going to fulfill it. He's going to finish everything that he set out to do. He's going to accomplish it. The zeal of the Lord will see this project through to completion. This is what Jesus came to do. He came as a baby, lived as a man, preached, demonstrated the coming kingdom of God. He offered hope to a hopeless world. That is good news. Good news for the broken, for the poor, for those who are in need of healing. Good news for those who are suffering. Good news to the defenseless. Good news to the widow and to the orphan and to the alien. Good news to the young. Good news to the old. Good news to the man. Good news to the woman. Good news to everyone, regardless of age or status. It's good news. Good news were the opening chords that were played when Christ came as a baby in that manger. I love that bit when the conductor just starts. There's that moment of anticipation. Have you ever seen... A conductor with an orchestra, the room goes silent. The baton goes up. This is the moment just before Christ came to earth. Down it comes. And it started the most amazing symphony you will ever hear. And it got louder, it crescendoed into the cross and it will be heard by everyone. When Christ comes again in glory. So I wonder this morning as I finish whether you're in need of good news. Need some good news. Look up to God. Look up to Christ. Find good news in in Jesus Christ. Uh, I wonder if if you just feel like you don't have any capacity left to hope. 
I just feel hopeless. I've got, no, I've got nothing left. The tank is dry. In a minute, we're going to pray together. And I'm going to ask the God of all hope to fill you with hope afresh this morning. Just give you enough energy, not only to keep going, but to keep going and keep going and keep going and holding on to the promises of God. I think this Advent, this, this next few 20 odd days that we have uh, before us is a wonderful opportunity to wait. I just hear as the people in Jerusalem heard the message and, and they then had to wait for it. I think this is a time of waiting for us. And trust that God would do all that he said he would do. At this Advent, I invite us to do what the psalmist invited us to do. Be still and know that God is God. Just be still. Wait. And know that God is God. And I'm going to pray that you find some serenity amongst the noise, the prevailing transcending noise that will that will cover our our world over the next few days i pray that you just know moments of peace moments of tranquility and joy that ability just to stand still while everyone else rushes on and i pray that you would know the good news of jesus christ and that you would know even if you don't have the energy to hold on to him that he is holding on to you this is good news the hope of things to come. Should we just bow our heads for a moment and just in stillness, we're going to leave a little bit of, of space and, and silence just to wait upon the Lord this morning. The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you are always with us. Your spirit filling this place with life, with hope, with joy, with peace, with love. Pray, Father, as we wait upon you, that we would have an increasing awareness of your spirit in this place this morning. I pray that you would warm our hearts with joy that you would fill our minds with peace. Lord, you would increase the levels of hope. Father, those sat here today who, who feel generally hopeless or just feel in hopeless situations, would you come by your spirit and move amongst us and Increase levels of hope in our lives. I just feel prompted this morning, as I mentioned that word, a joy, not to labor on this, but just to pray for those who have been gripped with um, varying levels of depression. It, it may be that depression is a very real and acute uh, reality for you that you're going through various treatments and counseling and medication and I pray that the spirit of God you would be released from that this morning I pray for those who may be at the other end of the spectrum maybe not even calling it uh, by any kind of medical prognosis I just feel low and down are those who wake up exhausted even before the day has begun. May you know the Spirit of God filling you with his life and his light, his energy. May you 
uh, be released today into a state of joy. You won't be able to stop smiling. Uh, you would feel a lightness of spirit where there once was a heaviness of heart. Come Holy Spirit, we pray. Continue to minister amongst us. I think maybe there's some people that have come with specific things on their, their mind and their heart this morning and you, you're almost waiting for permission to talk to God about those things. It's almost like you, you sat there almost kind of just waiting for that moment to be invited to hand it over to God. This is that moment. I'm just going to invite you to give whatever it is that is feeling like a burden to you. Just, just give it over to the Lord and in whatever words, whatever feelings or thoughts you might have, just begin to enter into dialogue with the Lord this morning. Spirit God, would you help release words in this place? And maybe if there needs to be a, an unblockage of, of, uh, of emotional response in those areas, would you do that, Lord? Release laughter where it's needed, release tears where, where they're needed, Lord. Spirit, thank you for your gentleness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you, Lord, for meeting with us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.